So you'll notice um, that my name is the only one on this talk, and that's because I'm the only one that did any work on it. So um, no, I'm, I'm kidding, actually. There's a whole host of people here that have helped. Um, and so what I'd like to talk about today is really some of the larval dispersal work that we've been doing in PNG, but specifically its impact on changing management regimes. It's actually been a really powerful um, element of change in that system. And what I'd like to talk about is just briefly um, this problem of spatial scale and larval dispersal. So imagine, if you will, that you've got these two managed areas, um, maybe an MPA or a protected spawning aggregation. And that sort of red cloud that goes away from that, that managed area is the cloud of larvae that are moving away from that site, right, that protected site. Now, there's no boundaries in this system, so any benefits that result from that kind of management system, right, are retained within the social boundary of the system. But if you actually start to subdivide the system a little bit more, here, it's still the same thing. We've got these political or social boundaries, these white dashed lines. The larvae that are dispersing from those managed sites are still staying or being retained within those social units, right? So any action that um, people are taking within their social system to protect spawning stock they're going to be the ones that benefit. In a lot of places like Papua New Guinea, the actual situation looks something more like this. Really small social or political units, often just a few kilometers of coastline. So people that are doing things in their particular patch of coastline that they can fish, um, and the things that we're asking them to do, might actually become undone a bit by larval dispersal. So in that left-hand example, the folks that are protecting their spawning site or protecting their particular reef, all the larvae that are being produced as a result of that protection are going to other communities that aren't actually doing anything. They're not bearing the cost of management. On the situation on the right, we've actually got kind of the best of both worlds. We've got the community that's actually doing the protection that's benefiting quite a lot because many of the larvae are being retained within that area, but then we've got some spillover to other community areas as well. So that just sort of sets the context for what I'll be talking about. Um, this is a study that we did in Manus in Papua New Guinea on this guy. This is a square-tailed coral trout, one of the many um, Plectropomus uh, species in the Indo-Pacific. Um, larvae spend about uh, 25 days out in the open water. They aggregate monthly in the location where we worked to spawn. So the aggregations are predictable in space and time. Fishermen know exactly where they are. They're a really rich target for fishing, obviously. It's a major fisheries target as a result. It's also one of the big targets for the live reef food fish trade. So these are boats that come down from Asia, fish these aggregations, take the fish live to Hong Kong, sell them in restaurants for a lot of money. So um, it is severely overfished throughout its range. And so what we wanted to do is um, go to this part of Papua New Guinea, Manas province, which is a pretty remote, underdeveloped place. Um, the fisheries there are managed through customary marine tenure relationships. So these are traditional relationships where communities say, these are our reefs, we fish these reefs, those are your reefs, you fish those reefs, and there's not a lot of back and forth between, right? So the actions that they can take on their reefs are completely independent of actions that are being done on other people's reefs. And in these particular communities that we're working with, um, for traditional reasons, these people only fish, that's all they do, they don't grow food. So they trade the fish that they catch with inland folks for, for agricultural um, products. And so they're completely and totally reliant on these reef systems. They've got problems, just like everywhere else, mostly driven by overfishing um, as a result of increasing population and better medical care, which is a good thing. But they're, they're facing some challenges with uh, how to manage these systems now because their villages are growing in size. And so they actually, some of the more traditional management regimes are starting to break down a little bit as a result. You get a lot of poaching and things like that. So what we did is um, we, we worked in this box down in the lower right uh, on the south coast of Manus Island. There's Manus in sort of relationship to Papua New Guinea itself, so it's kind of out there in the middle of nowhere. <clears throat> Here's our study site. Um, it consists of, uh, so here the water's blue, the reefs are gray, and then there's basically five uh, communities from left to right, Timonai, Tawi, Locha, Pere, and Bunai. Those white dashed lines are the community marine tenure boundaries that exist. Okay, and then those sort of purple blobs are the coral trout spawning aggregation sites. So the big blobs are the major spawning aggregation sites. So these are well over a thousand fish per aggregation. The smaller blobs are kind of two to three hundred fish. And what we did is we went in and we sampled adults. Um, at one of the large aggregation sites with the assistance of the community. 
um, and we did that over a two-week period. We then uh, went back about six months later and collected juveniles from, from throughout the entire study area. So that's the green blobs and those, the size of those, those uh, spheres are scaled to the number of juveniles that we collected from each of those sites. So each one is a reef. And we got about 782 juveniles. Then we ran some parentage analysis on that. And so the yellow ones are, are these are juveniles that we could actually um, assign back to adults from that aggregation that we sampled. So you'll see that there's yellow dot, or maybe you can't see some of these little ones over here, but the, there's actually um, dispersal of larvae from that managed aggregation site all throughout the entire coastal area. So the five community marine tenure areas are connected to each other by dispersal. Um, and so this is, if you actually break down the numbers by the proportion of recruitment in each community tenure area that's derived from that spawning site here, you see that this community that owns that site and it's actually has some effective management in place, about 20% of the juvenile coral trout in their tenure area are coming from their, their managed aggregation. These adjacent communities get 12 to 14% of their juveniles from this aggregation and then 13% are from here, 7% are from here. So these guys are definitely connected to each other. So we published that earlier this year in Current Biology. Um, and then we also were able to produce a, a larval dispersal kernel based on these data, which said that basically 95% um, of the larvae that are being produced from that aggregation are settling within about 33 kilometers of the aggregation site. The confidence intervals are, are quite big because we need to really, to really nail down what's going on out here. We need more samples at further distance. But so that's sort of the background story um, of what we found in that system. And we came away from that, uh, those results. We went back to the communities in November 2011 to present the results. So long before we actually got around to publishing this, we went to each of the communities and, and showed them the results of the work. And um, so my colleague, Rick Hamilton, who works with the Nature Conservancy, he and I sat down over beers one night and we said, okay, we wanna get like three take home messages that we want the communities to take away from this work. And what are they? One is that local management equals local benefits. So if you protect your aggregation site, you're gonna benefit from that because we're seeing lots of short distance larval dispersal, right? The community that was protecting their aggregation site, 20% of the juveniles in their tenure area were from that aggregation. So it's a strong incentive for local action. Um, the juvenile nursery areas that we found where there were high densities of juveniles were right inshore, right? And those inshore reefs weren't actually under any sort of protective regime at the time. They were also, because of their proximity to the shoreline, pretty vulnerable to changing land use practices. So we wanted to sort of drive home the point that you gotta integrate the land and sea management and that you should protect those juvenile areas. And because dispersal actually connects the five communities together, maybe you guys should not be managing these systems independently, like you do whatever you want in your tenure area, um, but you should maybe work together. So we thought, okay, if we get these three take home messages and we just sort of hit them at the end of the talk, that'll be fine and we'll, you know, we'll be happy with that. We didn't even get to the end of the talk and the communities were picking this up already. They said, well, well hang on, hang on. So if all the larvae are going over to here and here and here, shouldn't we actually be like doing things collectively? And we said, yeah, 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 but that's the last slide. Hang on, wait, <laughs> you know? And, and uh, so, you know, the other communities that hadn't been protecting their aggregation sites when we showed them the results, they said, hey, well, wait, 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 we should protect our aggregation as well. Yeah, well, wait, that's the last slide, man, come on. So anyway, they got it, they really, really got it. And the thing that I found really inspiring about this kind of um, larval dispersal work and this connectivity work it, is that it, it's not particularly easy to do scientifically, but the results are really intuitive. When you actually look at them, they're, qu they're quite powerful. And so after presenting the results in November 2011, um, we sort of uh, you know, talked about the, the study and, and what it meant, and they talked, told us what they thought it meant, and we were pretty much all on the same page. And so what I'd like to talk, to talk about now is kind of what happened after that presentation. So our first sort of, so here's, our, here's the aggregation where we worked initially, and it was actually under protection by that community, right? And the other ones really weren't. So our message was, Local management, local benefits, so come on, you guys should all be doing something. And this is what they did. They started protecting their aggregations right away. <clears throat> and they did so by um, limiting fishing, limiting spearfishing at night, which is the major way that these fish are vulnerable to, to um, being taken by the fishery. So that was a win, okay. So protect juvenile nursery areas on inshore reefs, which are also vulnerable to changing land use. So here's where we collected our juvenile samples. and. 
That's what they did in their management plans. They basically protected all the major nursery sites. Um, and you know, they, they're each writing their own management plans with the help of the Nature Conservancy. <clears throat> the other thing that was going on is there's this river here, which is actually a lot bigger um, than what this diagram shows. But it's a major um, river that, that uh, you know, out, outflows into this uh, coral reef area. And there was mining going on upstream. So they took the results of our work, which was showing where the juveniles were mapped, and um, they petitioned the provincial government, and they shut down the mining. Um, so the next thing they did is, uh, oh, the, the third thing was human communities connected by larval dispersal, so you guys should cooperate in your management, right? So what they did essentially is they removed the tenure boundaries, at least from, in terms of management. They're still fishing their own reefs, but they're no longer making um, decisions on an independent basis. They formed a cooperative management committee to get together to set collective targets for their fishing. Okay? So this was the situation in November 2011. By June 2012, this was the situation. So it completely transformed, they completely transformed their management regime with just a bit of information that we were able to provide them with larval dispersal and things like that. Now, at this stage, I would have been very happy to just sit back and say, we won, you know? Cool, we got some cool outcomes, but you know, we're scientists, so we have to ask questions like, is this really the best thing? Um, which, you know, it's stupid, really, but anyway. Um, so he here's the problem. The problem is one of ecological versus social boundaries, okay? So ecological meaning fish, social meaning people. So here's sort of a zoom in of here's that protected aggregation that we were working at. And at the same time, we were collecting fish for DNA samples. We were all, also tagging them. And then we were um, asking the fishermen to tell us when they caught a tagged fish, where they caught it from. So here's the social boundary between the, the community over here and this community here that we were working primarily with. And you can see that fish that were tagged here were actually going to some of the reefs inside that community tenure area. But they were also crossing the tenure boundary and going to the other community's tenure. These guys have 70 people in their community. These guys have 1,000. These guys are in trouble. These guys, not so much. OK. So what we could do from that kind of information, and we also did a similar tagging study at this aggregation as well, is we could say, OK, which reefs are actually supplying each of the aggregations in the system? So here's the subpopulation boundary, we think, for the, for the coral trout, for that that used this particular aggregation site. And so we just can color these reefs all green. So this aggregation, the adults are coming from these green reefs, which straddle this, this social boundary. We can do that for um, make some educated guesses about all of the aggregations, really. Um, so here's the green reefs that we just talked about. They're using that aggregation site. These red reef guys, they're using that one. The, these guys are the yellow reefs. Here you've got another situation where the aggregation's inside one community tenure, but most of the fish that are using it are actually from a different community tenure. So that's the fish scale, okay? So that's the ecological scale. Here's the community scale. Now, the, as I said, these, those white lines disappeared in terms of management decisions, but not in terms of where people fish, okay? Now, I'm gonna put this up here because I work with some smart people. And um, Mike Bode, he's sitting right there, so you can ask him a lot about this if you want. But basically what we try to do is we try to integrate the different scales, um, the ecological scales, the social scales, through a fisheries model, right? So here we've got an equation for density-dependent recruitment of the coral trout. Here we've got one uh, a population um, equation for the females, but we're also adding in aggregation scale fishing. So these, this is fishing taking place on the aggregation and fishing take pla taking place on the reef. Um, these guys are protogenous hermaphrodites, so they transition from females to males, so we've got separate equations for them. Now that we've got a larval dispersal kernel, we can actually sort of populate that throughout the entire coast, and we can say, okay, each um, uh, fish spawning aggregation is producing larvae that sort of follow our larval dispersal uh, kernel that we, that we got from our data. So here's the larval dispersal scale. So we actually know through a lot of intensive sort of social work um, or, or socioeconomic um, data collection, we know exactly the number of fishers in each community. What we did is we assumed that each fisher is sort of fishing at the same rate, and through time, the communities are kind of optimizing their harvesting. Now, they can do that in one of two ways. They can do that independently, right? That's the old situation, where the, the community tenure boundaries are in place and everybody's doing things independently, so each community is optimizing by itself. 
or they can do it in the new situation, which is where they're making collective decisions about their fishery, right? In both of those situations, you're going to reach an equilibrium between fish and fishing, right? So the big question is, does it work better if you all cooperate or if you just do things by yourself? Please, please, cooperation, please. Yes, cooperation works better, actually. Um, <laughs> So here we've got full, here's catch on the y-axis, kilograms per year. Here's the communities um, organized from east to west, one through five. The green bars are if they're cooperating, so they're sort of making collective decisions together. Here's the one where they're just doing things by themselves. And what we find is that total catch goes up. It, after equilibrium is reached, total catch, up, catch increases by 15%. The equilibrium fish populations themselves increase by 70% and you actually don't have to fish as hard, so you get a slight decrease in effort as well. So yay. Um, conclusions then, the whole first part of the talk was just to kind of set the stage, but what I'm really excited about is how this work can really rapidly transform management regimes um, by pro providing data that's, again, not, not that easy to get, but really easy to understand. People can sort of intuitively come to their own conclusions about, hey, yeah, we protect our aggregations, we're gonna win. We work together, we're gonna win. We should protect the, the nursery habitats. And so I really, I'm excited about that, and I'm, uh, there's a number of projects I've got going on in Papua New Guinea and the Solomon Islands, um, Palau, Hawaii, things like that, that are working with communities and trying to produce this kind of data in various different measures. Um, and I think uh, everywhere I've been and talked about it, it's been a really powerful sort of discussion point about changing the way things are being done now and perhaps improving the way things are being done. Um, and at least the preliminary results suggest that cooperative management does, in fact, improve yield within um, a, a fishery that's connected by level dispersal. So thanks very much for your time.